Odin, Odin Venison. And next month I will be turning 13. Today, I have the privilege of doing the introduction for Senator-elect David Lightholm. David is a libertarian. He thinks that the government should stop treating us like children. <laughs> Senator, I know how you feel. <laughs> David belongs to a political party known as Liberal Democrats. Everybody used to ignore them. But, with some help from his friends, David fixed all that. <laughs> David used to be a vet. That's a pretty good job. He also has degrees in business and law. He must be pretty smart and work very hard. I also heard a rumour that he has four cats. <laughs> That's a lot of cats. <laughs> My dad is pretty excited that David will be a senator. Many other people are also. To tell us all about it, please welcome Senator-elect David Lightham. Thank you, Odin. What an introduction. I'll never get another one like that in my political life, I guarantee. Um, I was having a, a little think about what it was like to be Libertarian of the Year, um, having not even started being a Libertarian in Parliament. And uh, I was initially a little embarrassed, which was the intention, I think, um, and uh, thought, OK, this is a little bit like, as I said last night, Obama getting a Nobel Prize. But I think it is quite an accomplishment to have an openly libertarian, I use that word after having stolen, half stolen the phrase from the gay community, um, openly libertarian, openly gay, you know, you've got to be out there and proud. Um, and uh, and uh, it is quite an accomplishment to get uh, somebody from an openly libertarian party into the Senate or into Parliament of any description. And uh, so it, it is the beginning of a whole new chapter in, we hope, libertarian politics in Australia, or politics in general. It, I didn't do it myself. Um, there were lots of other people who helped me get there. I was certainly in the middle of it all, and, uh, and most of the time had at least one hand on the steering wheel. Um, I, there's a lot of people in this room who contributed to where I am today, and I don't want to go through them all, but I do want to single out Peter Whelan who has been, uh, <coughs> I guess, my, my colleague in arms, my um, uh, fiendish friend, uh, my uh, supporter, uh, equally contributing to the funds of the party up until September when all your taxes came our way, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, has been you know, by my side the whole way through since 2005 when we really got we joined the party and got stuck into it. It had been going for a few years before we got involved, but all the uh, um, progress we made has uh, pretty much been since we got federal registration in 2007. But just to sort of reassure you that uh, if you voted for me uh, in September, or you think you might vote for me again in the future, or my party, just give you just a very quick snapshot on, about my politics. I knew more about Karl Marx um, long before I'd ever heard of Milton Friedman. In fact, the first I heard of Milton Friedman was that he was a really evil man. There was a thing called the Chicago School, and that uh, Friedman was probably personally responsible for assassinating Salvador Allende in Chile and installing Augusto Pinochet. And I thought I was a socialist uh, back in those days, and I thought, gee, he must be really, really wicked. Whereas Karl Marx, of course, was kind, handing out, I didn't have any money in those days, so I didn't mind, handing out other people's money to people I thought were terribly deserving. It was only much later that I discovered uh, John Stuart Mill, Adam Smith, um, and Milton Friedman, of course. The, the two philosophers, though, that I suppose that I, that I find most instructive would be John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. And uh, every time I get exposed to Hayek and Mises and so forth, I, I say, oh, that's all really difficult, I uh, retreat to Locke and Hobbes. And Locke's view of life, and just for those who aren't familiar, was that people get on quite well by themselves, really don't need governments for much, 
but there are some things that they do need governments for just to maintain a civilised society. But most of, their, most of the time they get on just fine. So they agree as a sort of a social contract, here's the origin of social contract, so as a sort of a social contract, they agree to give up a few of their rights to the government in order to maintain a civilised society. It's a conditional arrangement, they only give them up to the extent that, that that's needed to maintain a civilised society. In fact, his view was the government only has three things that it needs to um, look out for, life, liberty and private property, and after that everything else looks after itself. And that if the government gets too big for, it, big for its boots, you take those powers back again and, uh, and put the government back in its place. Now Thomas Hobbes was the origin of the nasty British and short um, theory of life, that man is at permanent war and uh, we can't get on by ourselves unless we uh, give up all our rights to the government, the sovereign he called it in, in those days because this was hundreds of years ago. You give up all your rights to the sovereign and then the sovereign gives them back to you according to how he thinks you deserve them, whether you're, whether you're good enough to uh, justify them. Hobbes was also responsible for arguing that the sovereign should take note of what the people wanted and be a kindly ruler, but uh, the source of rules, the source of rights, the source of authority, if you like, came from the sovereign under Hobbes' view of the world, under Locke's view of the world, we all had our rights, we just gave up a little, a little piece of them to the, to the government or the sovereign, whatever you want to call it, and uh, that was used for good purposes. So I am unmistakably a Lockean, and I think our leftist opponents are Hobbesians. So we believe that our rights are inherent, natural. Some of you might believe they come from God. Some might believe that we're just born with them, they're just inherent. But that doesn't really matter where you think they come from, as long as you don't think they come from the government. And, and I, I absolutely don't think they come from the government. The government can enunciate them, can um, put them into laws, can protect them, but doesn't give them to us. So that's my point. That's just by way of being able to get out of the building. Um, so <laughs> reassure you that uh, I haven't elected a status by mistake. Um, I want to talk about the LDP for a moment also because I think it's very important that you understand where I see uh, the party going and now that I'm in the Senate and, uh, and everything has changed. Before the election, we were just one of 54 parties all uh, competing for a space on the ballot paper. That's no longer the case. Everything has changed. I see myself as the chief salesman for the Liberal Democrats. Um, our, my objective is, for the next few years, and probably within my political life, a senator, an LDP senator in every state. Um, in fact, the ultimate goal uh, for the next few elections, at least, is uh, a senator in every state in every election. So ending up with 12 Liberal Democrat senators in the, in the Senate. And that's doable. We have 3,300 members at the moment. We have active branches in every state except Tasmania. Um, I think it's entirely possible that we could win two or three Senate seats in the 2016 election, assuming there's no early election. I don't think that's terribly likely. And in 2019, the one after that, we could easily win one in every state. So that's, that's the objective. I know that some of you will say, well, what are you going to do about legislation and what are you going to do about the nanny state and all those sort of things. And I'll talk about those in a moment. But my big picture is more LDP senators, more libertarians in Parliament. We cannot achieve a whole lot with just one voice, mine, in a Senate of 76, and when uh, the vast majority of those other 76, there are a few uh, honourable exceptions, but the vast majority of those 76 would love to take your money and spend it on their favourite topics. That's their life. They do never, do, don't ever stop to think, should I take the money? All they're over arguing about is how to spend it. I can spend it better than the other bloke. That's all they ever do. So the objective, of course, is to get more LDP senators in so that we basically are able to say to the government, 
okay, I have one part of your anatomy in that hand, and one part of your anatomy in that hand. Do I put my hands together or go further apart? And uh, when we are in that, when we are in that position, um, then we will be able to talk about libertopia. But until then, <laughs> we, and we are not talking about libertopia in the imminent future. Now, I'm probably telling you uh, how to suck eggs here, but as I said, there are 76 senators, 33 government, and Labor plus the Greens uh, have 35, and there are eight minor party senators. There are eight, apart from myself, uh, Bob Day, from Fernley First in South Australia, the Palmy United people, so from Queensland, Western Australia and Tasmania, the motoring enthusiasts, Senator from Victoria, Ricky Muir, and the two who are continuing from the previous election, John Madigan of the DLP and Nick Xenophon, who, Nick Xenophon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so eight of us, and for the government to get legislation through, it will require six out of eight. For that's if the Labor and the Greens oppose it, and that's not always going to be the case. There will be situations where that won't occur. Although since September they have opposed almost everything, and three can block it. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, legislation which has the Greens and Labor support can get through the Senate with just four votes. Four of those eight. So, from the point of view of getting a private members bill up, um, not a lot of point if the government's opposed to it, perhaps, but there are symbolic reasons why that might be useful. Um, it's not so hard to get stuff through the Senate. Uh, it's easier to block stuff, I suppose, if I can put it that way. Um, just a little bit of, uh, before I get on to some issues, just a little bit about uh, what life is like being a senator elect. It's, um, it's sort of an extraordinary suspended animation phase. Um, you have no staff, no budget, um, no help. You have no sources of information other than the internet and the newspapers and so forth. The media is all over you like a rash and uh, you're expected to know stuff. And uh, I've actually got to the point where uh, they ring me up and say, so-and-so is saying this, what's your comment on that? And I force them to tell me what they think they, that is the story before I answer. And uh, I just, uh, you know, some, sometimes it gets to the stage where I haven't got enough information to talk about it. They do like talking to me and to Bob Day because we can at least put some words together and I'm, the, other, the other senators are <laughs> <laughs> uncontactable, <laughs> uncontactable um, don't want to talk to the media, or when they do, um, it's not worth it. Um, I've done, so I've done hundreds of media interviews. Um, I got contacted after a few weeks um, by Mike Stutchbury from the Financial Review, invited to lunch and asked if I'd like to write a fortnightly column for the Financial Review. I, he doesn't, don't tell him please, but I wouldn't have needed lunch. It would have, um, I would have paid actually. So, uh, so it's, it's an absolutely fantastic opportunity. You don't get that sort of thing very often. And it's given me a great um, opportunity to set my agenda. You'd probably be aware that all the media wanted to talk about straight after I got elected was gun, excuse me, gun laws. And uh, I managed to deflect it mostly, but you know, as a first impression it wasn't ideal. Um, I didn't back off from the, my support for gun laws and uh, gun law reform, but uh, I want people to think about the LDP in different terms from, as just a gun law party. So uh, I didn't set that agenda, it wasn't by choice. And I got plenty of people telling me, stop talking about guns. But the only way I could have done that is to, done, is to have done what several of the other senator-elects did, which was to turn off their phones, and I didn't want to do that. So I had to answer it, but the column in the Financial Review has allowed me to get back onto my agenda. And uh, every time I do a column and I put out a press release about it, it at least gets me one interview, and quite often half a dozen, and sometimes quite a lot. They don't always get it right. Sometimes the stories are totally screwed up. But uh, you know, still, I'm still working on the, on the assumption. Most of the time, any publicity is good publicity. So um, 
the Department of the Senate, there is a whole public service department um, oriented around Parliament and looking after parliamentarians and so forth. Now, I suppose I should have known that, but I didn't. I've been, I'm a political junkie, I've been around politics and issues all my life, pretty much. And boy, am I on a steep learning curve even so. So, for the people who didn't expect to get elected, I knew I was going to get elected three weeks before the election. I had done the Anthony Green calculator, I knew I was in. And it, trust me, it wasn't 9.5% of Liberal voters who cocked it up. <laughs> um, there might have been one or two who did that. And nor, but I also don't believe 9.5% of New South Wales voters are Libertarians either. So let's um, keep our feet on the ground there. But uh, they, uh, so, um, uh, where was I? Part of the Senate. Steep learning curve. Steep learning curve, yes, that's right. So there's a whole department of the Senate oriented around um, looking, after, uh, looking after us. So they organised an introduction day for us. Um, it was quite funny. They're very nice, uh, very helpful, uh, although in a public service -y way. And, <laughs> and, no, no control. No, they're, they're, they're very respectful, to be honest. I, bit over this senator-elect this and senator-elect that stuff. I'm really not big on it. But anyway, they organised an induction day for an introduction day for us. We're actually getting a, a more formal introduction to the Senate in the first week in July. And that's Senator School, they said, with a twinkle in their eye. So the one in November was Senator Preschool. So we, it was good. Uh, it was quite a good introduction. We got a show shown around the Senate, shown around the offices. Um, given all sorts of stuff to read. In fact, I had these massive cards and books to read with Senate procedure and histories and all the rules and all that sort of stuff to read. Uh, I'm going to read little bits of it. But, but, uh, but anyway, they, they were very helpful, so that, that was quite useful. I learned a few things and gained a few contacts on who to ring up when I need to know, well, when can my staff start? If I advertise for staff, um, who's going to pay for it? Is it on my account or is it, does the um, Parliament House pay for it? Um, what about my office? All those sorts of things. So there's been uh, quite a lot of stuff to find out and they've been fairly helpful. Just on that subject of office, um, we had a bit of toing and froing with the department and then the minister got involved, but my office is going to be in Dremoyne, not far from where I live. That's really convenient for me. I now, I now know I will have five staff. Um, they, they divide them into two categories. There's electorate staff and there's personal staff. Um, four of them are electorate staff and uh, two are, and one's called personal staff. I've chosen the person to fill that position. I've chosen one of the electorate staff, who's in fact in the front row here, Max Reese, from the Australian Environment. The, up, to, up to now, the head of the Australian Environment Foundation, I'm advertising and interviewing currently for three others. John Madigan and Nick Xenophon have two personal staff, and that was a decision. And they're at the discretion of the Prime Minister, curiously enough. And the previous Prime Minister, I'm not sure whether it's Rudolf Gillard, allowed them two personal staff. Tony Abbott's view is that we should have one, um, but that is under review and it will be reviewed after July. I'm thinking if he gets the carbon tax repeal through, We'll probably get two. If he doesn't, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that's occurred is uh, lobbying. I've had lots of people want to come and see me and bend my ear. Um, I'm generally fairly sympathetic to that. Um, you know, you have to... Um, on the 6th of September, um, I didn't know everything. And just because I got elected doesn't mean I know everything now either. I'm no smarter than I was. So I think listening to other people and hearing their arguments and, and accepting that uh, I don't have to agree with them, but, but I ought to listen to their argument, I think it's part of the job. So I've been reluctant to put them off, but I've had no staff, still running, running my own company, and uh, so I've been a bit picky about that, but I have had lobbyists come to see me, and that's, it's been quite useful, and the best of them are worth listening to. Some of them are not quite so good, but it's worked all right. So anyway, the timetable is... Uh, induction, as I said, the first week of July, and the first sitting weeks are the second and third week of July. So during that period, um, I'll be officially sitting on the red, the red benches as a Liberal Democrat senator. My first speech 
as long as they don't change it on me, we'll be on the 9th of July. So if any of you want to come along and cheer and risk being threatened with chuck, being chucked out of the, as a visitor's chamber, you're most welcome. In fact, they, the other centre of this thing is pretty funny when the gallery is full of rowdy supporters. So if you feel like coming along, go right ahead. Um, and the following sitting after those two is uh, 26th of August, so a big long break. And so I'm thinking I should probably just try to survive July, and by that stage I'll have a clear idea of, uh, of uh, things that I've been thinking about and getting right. The immediate Senate business will be the carbon and mining tax repeal. There are 14 new senators, and they'll obviously try to fit in some first speeches in that period. Uh, incidentally, they don't call them maiden speeches anymore, there are no maidens left. And, <laughs> Uh, so they have to, at some stage, all give first speeches, so they fit them in amongst the business as well. I'm not too sure, I have tried to find out from the government what their other priorities are during that fortnight in July. Uh, there's, some in, there's an infrastructure bill, there's the Qantas Sale Act, um, one or two other things, temporary protection visas and so forth, but the, a lot will depend on what they get through during the budget session, what, what their priorities are in July. So I don't, I don't even know how to prepare um, prior to July. It's going to be interesting to see how the government approaches me and probably I'm, Bob Day and I are probably the most prepared, most ready for this job of all the new senators. And uh, the government hasn't even spoken to us about their legislation yet. They've just done a bit of nice to know you, um, I'm here if you want me sort of meeting. Nothing else has occurred. They certainly haven't done any briefing on any legislation. So if, uh, if they want to get their stuff through, apart from the carbon tax and mining tax, which probably the pub people, motoring enthusiast people, have already thought about, then they're leaving their run a little bit late. They're going to have to do some briefings. Now, I've um, been thinking about how to approach the job and, and in terms of outcomes. What would I like to achieve? Um, I've said what I'd like to see in terms of uh, the future of the Liberal Democrats because I think what I will be able to achieve by myself is fairly limited. And I'm, I, I probably will say that two or three more times because I want to get expectations under control. Um, my election does not signal the end of the nanny state, the end of the statist world. Um, you know, a reversal of all the noxious um, control freak things that we have to endure. But it may be the beginning of that, maybe the beginning of the end of those things, but it's certainly not the end of them. So we need to keep our feet on the ground and, and stay realistic about it. It's going to take more than one senator, it's going to take um, quite a lot. Um, it may even take winning uh, seats in the lower house before we really turn the tide back again. But, having said all that, there's no need to be pessimistic. There are some things that I think um, I will be able to push on and probably make progress. There are certainly some members of the Liberal Party in the Senate who are overjoyed at my election. They've spoken to me on the phone or have come to see me and have indicated that they could not be happier about it all. They've told me how frustrated it, it, frustrating it is to them to be in a party where they can't speak their minds outside the party room. They have to toe the party line. And uh, not that I'm looking at you, Peter Phelps, but I feel for you. Um, <laughs> I speak my mind. <laughs> anyway. This criminal government. <laughs> anyway. What they have said to me is, not only are they on my side and cheering for my success, they will help me. So there will be times when I expect I will find out things that the uh, only way I could find out is via a sympathetic Liberal Senator or their staff, perhaps. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not pessimistic about the possibility of uh, making a difference, um, but I am realistic and there's no point being starry-eyed about it. So, the things, and I've been asking people at various times, I'm going to have a little list. I've got a little list, as Gilbert and Sullivan would say. They'd really not be missed. 
I don't, this is not an execution list though, the grand executioner. This is a list of things that I should bring out when the government comes to me and says, David, we need your vote. Your vote is the crucial one here. What should I have on my list is the question I've been asking myself. I've been asking other people as well. So there's a series of things that I think uh, could be on my list. It's a bit of a dynamic thing at the moment, and um, uh, I guess it'll probably stay dynamic um, pretty much, but there are a few things that are on my, on my list currently. I'll just go and run through them. Um, I think it would be possible to steal the gay marriage issue from the left with a private member's bill. It's not a left-wing issue, it's a liberty issue. I'm not gay and I don't... I do not understand why the silly buggers want to get married. But <laughs> so, uh, bad enough being straight and getting married. <laughs> but, you know, they're entitled to find out for themselves. <laughs> and so, my, my thinking is, this is not a left-wing issue. Let's start by educating both the left-wing media and the public who think it's a left-wing issue conservatives who think it's a left-wing issue, let's educate them that it is not. It's a liberty issue. So I have a private member's bill being prepared um, for me to introduce into the Senate. It's being written now um, on gay marriage. It will be a deregulatory approach. So it will It will basically take out bits in the Marriage Act that uh, you know, give the government the right to say which genders can get married. That's the approach. I haven't seen the draft yet. It's still being messed around with. But uh, that's the instructions and I'm sure that that's how it will work. The same thing can be done with assisted suicide, um, mostly called voluntary euthanasia. We don't like that term because we think euthanasia implies knocking off granny and to get the inheritance, and so therefore assisted suicide has a more uh, user-friendly uh, connotations, I think. Once again, uh, there are people working on private member, a private member's bill for me. It's been done twice before, by the, but both times by the Greens. I mean, it wouldn't matter what the Greens brought up, the government wouldn't support it, and probably neither would I, if the truth was known. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's coming from me, uh, all it needs is a second to get it up, I understand, from in procedure. Um, and it's, it's coming from a non-left side. I can present it as a liberty issue. Um, it is something I actually do care about. And uh, so I think, once again, it will, we will steal the ground from, from the left. Data retention is another issue. I don't, that's, a, that's not a, a, a private member's bill. That's a proposal for uh, government legislation to force ISPs to retain uh, internet data for two years. At the moment, all the running on that has been taken by Scott Ludlam. Now, whatever you think of Tony Abbott, I thought uh, Scott Ludlam's speech about him was just obnoxious, yes. simply obnoxious. He was really foul, and plus it wasn't true anyway as well. So um, it would be quite nice, I think, to steal the ground out from, out from under him. It's not a left-wing issue, it's not a Greens issue, it's a liberty issue. The government shouldn't force ISPs to hang on to data just for the, the possibility that you might, that somebody, a very small number of people, might use it in a criminal purpose. It's like having a, a national fingerprint bank or a national DNA bank. No difference at all. And uh, so, uh, as you know, uh, firearms gun laws are close to my heart. I got hammered over it big time, straight after the election. Um, it is a state issue by and large, but John Howard made it a federal issue. I am going to see if I can get the National Firearms Agreement ripped up. It's the... <laughs> the National Firearms Agreement was the device that John Howard used to say to the states, if you don't sign up to this, you won't get any money. And the states uh, are duly obliged. So. Getting rid of that wouldn't actually change the gun laws. All it would do is give the states back control over it. Um, but you know, under a competitive federalism thinking, um, some of them will loosen them and see how it goes. Uh, as Helen has suggested, that has no effect on crime anyway. And uh, so hopefully some sensible heads will realise that. Um, 
Paid parental leave won't get through unless they stick it into appropriations or the, the Greens support the Liberals. And even then, that may not occur. Um, so I may have an impact on that, but I don't see it as my issue. Um, I will have uh, something to say about it, but I, I can't own that. That's, that's out there and being involved already, but I'll be glad to vote against it. Um, the 18C issue is also out there, big and bold. I don't know where that's going to end up. Um, some liberals think, some liberal liberals think it's um, not going to survive. That uh, hasn't been handled politically uh, correctly. Um, others, I was talking to Tim Wilson last night, he's convinced there'll be some sort of amendment to 18C get up. Um, I had thought that I might put 18C on my list of things that when the government comes to me and says I want your vote, um, I, might, I might have said 18C. I think events have overtaken that now, and, uh, but I'll do my best to um, see that whatever amendments go through on that are as good as they can be. I have, I, I've been thinking about are there other areas in which um, I can sort of change things permanently, and I've been wondering whether I can say to the government sunset clauses should go into everything. Um, not repeal bills, obviously, but um, <laughs> pretty much, you know, pretty much all legislation initiatives, you know, new initiatives, could have a sunset clause in it. Once they got into the habit of that, I think they'd get over it. Um, they'd, they'd stop fighting it and just sort of treat it as normal, a little bit like um, a regulatory impact statement, that sort of thing that goes with standard legislation. I think, you know, you can have sunset clauses of 20 years for you know, profound things that nobody disagrees about. You can have five years for controversial things, that kind of stuff. So I, I think there's potential for that. Now, it's not a big deal in its, in its own um, by itself, but if it became routine, if it became part of the routine, we could, in fact, by almost by Fabian libertarianism, as somebody said this morning, um, start to wind back just the sheer volume of regulation, the sheer volume of legislation. Um, I don't know whether I can make any progress on marijuana. Um, I'd like to. Medical marijuana is the uh, way through on that one. Medical, uh, medical uses of things are um, federal control under the TGA. Um, the state government New South Wales state government ducked it recently on medical marijuana. Not surprising, in spite of the committee actually recommending that it be approved. It's not that surprising because if they had gone into that area, it would have blurred the lines between federal and state control of, of uh, medical things, of medical drugs. Um, recreational control is, of course, a state issue. And uh, not much I'll be able to do about that um, from the Senate. But of course, we are running for state elections. And uh, hopefully, if we can get some people into state parliaments, we might make some progress on that. Now, so those are the areas where legislation specifically will come up that I will be involved in. There are a whole list of things where I can influence the agenda. Um, one vote in the Senate doesn't give me control of the budget, expenditure, tax, none of that sort of stuff. But I can talk about it. I can talk about welfare targeting. Um, uh, Jenny Lindsay talked about the moral basis for welfare this morning. I read Peter Saunders' paper on that too, and that spoke to me very loudly. We have to be able to say uh, we are not hard-hearted, therefore the most deserving in the community are entitled to welfare. Um, we, are, uh, we have to make sure that nobody starves in the streets, that little children who are sick do not stay sick, unnecessarily be from lack of money, that kids get an education no matter how rich or poor their families are. We have to be sure of that. But the moral basis of that is to say, but those who can afford to pay should pay. That's the moral basis for, for uh, uh, being generous to people who are needy, but not generous to people who, are, who don't need it. At the moment, the welfare is poorly targeted. And I've had plenty of interviews with left-wing media where I've put the argument that welfare for the needy uh, needs to be maintained and possibly even increased in cases, but there is only so much welfare to go around, 
And if you pay it to people who don't need it, there is less for those who do need it. And I've won that argument every time. So I think we can make progress on that. Welfare targeting, funding of health education uh, in particular. Occasionally I have even won the argument where I've said, why does the, does the government have to own schools? Why does the government have to own hospitals? All it has to ensure is that there are schools providing an education to a, to a proper standard. There's no necessity for it to own schools or employ, employ teachers. No necessity for it to employ medical uh, personnel or own hospitals, as long as, it has, as long as it ensures they exist and they're available and the system is accessible by everybody under some sort of system. That can be talked about and we can start to change the dynamic that the government is not some benevolent bucket of money and it's just being miserable when it doesn't hand out enough of it. We can make uh, the anti-protectionism uh, uh, anti case quite well and uh, I, I do that quite a lot with my writing if, if you haven't been reading it. We can make the argument for uh, to get the government out of the energy market um, so things like direct action, that might come up as legislation and I suspect I'll stick it into appropriation so I might not be able to do anything with it. But uh, if it comes up as, uh, as specific legislation, um, I'll be able to make a song and dance about that. I, have, I will have plenty of friends in the National Party who would like to see the end of the renewable en energy target. That would be a good thing as well. There is an issue of self-defence uh, under the Howard Gun Laws 1996, the right to have any means of self-defence, carry any means of self-defence was effectively removed. That includes non-lethal things. So I've been interviewed on concealed carry with the shock horror media um, uh, doing its best to make me appear as some sort of troglodyte. But the bigger issue is that you can't have a pepper spray or a mace or a personal taser or anything like that. It, it is illegal for anybody, including little women, um, elderly, whatever, to have any device for their self-defence on their person. It's illegal. It's, in, it's utterly inexcusable, that sort of thing. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> has... Nobody will touch that issue, including the Shooters and Fishers Party. They won't go near it. So, there, so issues like that, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm the last speaker and, uh, and it's not bad form for last speakers to go over time. And every time I speak at these, at any event, I find that people want to ask me questions, what about this, what about that, so I think I might stop there, except I have one other um, point that I'd like to make, is that um, my fellow Senator-elect Bob Day is a libertarian on economic issues. Um, he and I are like two peas in a pod on those things, it's very reassuring. He's quite conservative on social issues, so I won't be asking for his support on, on some of the other things. But, but he's a good guy, he's a decent, decent man, and, uh, and he and I, I expect, will work together. On industrial relations, I really am so ignorant that I think I will be leaving that to Bob. If Bob thinks it's a good idea, I think it's a good idea. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, that's probably the safest thing to do. The other issue that he's passionate about, he's only really passionate about two. One is IR, a job. Everyone has a job and everyone has a house, a housing affordability. So that he, he's talked about those issues for 20 odd years. Again, I will agree with him. And uh, so I won't be taking them up as personal issues. I've got a long list of other things that I am interested in that I would, will poke the government on. The processes for poking the government are good in the Senate, so you have committees and you have Senate estimates. Senate estimates is when you drag the bureaucrats up in front of your committee and you ask them embarrassing questions <laughs> and, and try to get them to change their ways and I look forward to that. Committees are an opportunity to uh, direct legislation, change policy, that sort of thing. One of the committees, I'm not going to do lots of that because, as I said, my primary task is, as Chief Salesman for the LDP, is to get more votes so that we win more seats uh, next elections, but I will be working in one or two committees, and one of them will be rural and regional because my business is agricultural, agribusiness, and I look forward to crossing swords with that old agrarian socialist, Bill Heffernan. 
<laughs> I think I'll stop there rather than keep you all late into overtime. If you have any questions, I'm happy to deal with them. So it is now 5 o'clock, but we're happy to go over time if you are. Uh, some people, I understand, will have to leave, but uh, Tim and I don't have a fixed deadline. I don't think David does, so if you want to stick around for a while, we're not being kicked out yet, so we can, uh, we're happy to go over time. So, questions, starting with Julian. Yeah, my, my point is only I, I'm just delighted to hear that list of activities, and, uh, and I think I speak for a lot of people in the room when, uh, when I would say, just ask but help whenever you need it, because I think you'd be surprised we'll, we'll, we'll put our shoulders to the wall. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you indicate, David, you indicate, uh, you indicated you'd be working on a board day in the next, in the next set, particularly economic issues. Out of the remaining six senators, who do you see yourself working on the, like, after Bob? It's too soon to say. I've met, I haven't even met them all, I've met uh, Jackie Lambie from Tasmania, uh, Glenn Lazarus from Queensland, and Ricky Muir from Victoria. Um, I didn't really have a chance to talk to Glenn Lazarus in sufficiently well to know, uh, to predict how he'll go. Um, he's a businessman and so I think we'll get on fine. Um, Jackie Lambie is very concerned about uh, veterans' benefits, and I'm not sure there are too many other issues that she's too bothered about. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know how that will shape up, but uh, but it's important to understand, uh, you know, what concern motivates people. Ricky Muir, I think I probably have more in common with him um, than any of the other cross-party senators. He's a hunter, um, a shooter, um, four-wheel drive driver. Um, likes going bush, uh, you know, that's me as well. Um, I think we'll get on just fine. We've recruited uh, members at Summer Nats, which is the motor enthusiast party mecca. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that you know, on those grounds we should get on just fine. His party is a bit peculiar. They've been um, influenced by Glen Drury. And so uh, they're currently being a little frosty towards us. But I, once you start working with people, everything changes. And that that also, I suppose, goes for the pub party, the pub people. Uh, once the uh, uh, once we get into the Senate, Clive won't be in the Senate. Clive will be on the other side of the House, or the other side of the Parliament. Uh, you have um, not that much contact between the House and the Senate. Um, so there will there will be his three senators there without Clive to sort of pull their strings, even if, even if they were willing to have their strings pulled. And my feeling is that they probably won't. My feeling is they don't have a sort of unifying philosophy. There's really nothing that joins them together other than the convenience that they come under a party banner and that Clive funded an election campaign. What else unites them? So I, I can't see their um, their unity lasting on a philosophical basis, on a philosophical basis for very, very long. If it lasts longer, it'll be on a convenience basis. So we'll see how that plays. But my feeling is that six months, um, they will be, their individualism will become apparent. And uh, so we'll see where that ends up. Now, one thing about, um, one of the predictions made about Clive is that he may find the relevance deprivation too much, being in the House where he's only one of 150 votes, whereas this, the Senate positions that he uh, funded, I suppose, the campaigns, they're getting all the fun in the Senate. And, uh, and it has been suggested to me that he may well wish to uh, replace them uh, in, uh, in the Senate so that he's in the, in the limelight, so to speak. Um, okay, we've got only a couple more questions, I think, but uh, Hannah and then Mark, and then we'll see. Hello, David. It's been a privilege to hear your opinions on libertarianism. Um, I would like to ask, though, what is your true stance on proposed changes to the RDA? Um, if you do not 
Oh, oh, 18C. 18C. Um, if it was up to me, I'd repeal 18C. Yeah. Um, I've said that several times in public. It, it, I mean, I think. You did not know if you would fully support it. Or... How do you get one question? Lots of people have questions. Okay. It, 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 I'd support the Brandis, the Brandis uh, amendments because they're better than the status quo. But if I was writing legislation, it would si simply say, delete 18C. Mark? Yeah, I know it will depend on the circumstance, but in general, if the government offers you a deal, some things that you don't agree with, uh, in exchange for some things that you want, is there any guiding principle as to, um, as, as to whether you would take the deal or not? Do, do, do saying no outrank saying yes, or vice versa? Um, you have to get a bit hypothetical, but there's two rules. I'll never vote for an increase in taxes or a reduction in liberty. Um, those rules are untouchable. So, I, I mean, in the carbon tax repeal bills, for example, there are eight of them, I think. One of them is to reverse a tax cut, which was introduced in compensation. Well, guess what? I'm not going to vote for that. But I'll vote for, I'll vote for the other ones, because they're just repealing the, um, the, the carbon tax mechanism. So. Um, but if the government, there are some issues on which I am indifferent, and uh, so there, if the government wants to uh, negotiate and says I'd like you to vote for this, that's when my little list comes out, and so you know I might be able to make progress on that. As a broad thing, if they took it to the election um, and it was a you know front and centre. I'd respect the mandate if I'm indifferent to whether it goes through or not. I'd respect the government's mandate. I think you know governments are entitled to implement their policies unless they offend my policies. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, but you have to get very hypothetical then before you say, well, if they offer you something really good, but you have to give ground on something that you don't like very much. Um, then it becomes an almost a utilitarian thing, or a, or a you know, two steps forward, one step back type of situation. I can't envisage an example of that, but um, uh, it's not a no-never situation. I'm, I'm open to negotiation, but it would have to be progress, significant progress. Okay. Um I think I'd uh, like to add my own little bit at the end. Dave was very right. You can't go. You can't start to try and thank all the people that have pitched in to the LDP over the years because then we'll inevitably forget people. But I would like to mention uh, one person who a lot of people don't know of his involvement, uh, and that is Duncan Spender, who was the second ever member of the party. Uh, the party wouldn't exist today but for the effort he put in in the early years, the, the years before many of you heard of the party. And he's come back uh, in recent years and put in a hell of a lot of work behind the scenes as well. So I think uh, Duncan's one person that you might not have heard of, who uh, hopefully in, in the future you will, he's a, he's a great economist. So I, I wanted to uh, just give him a shout out, unfortunately he's not here. Um, and uh, with that, can you please all join me in thanking David Lane?